Hello, my sweet summer children. In honor of the fall season and everything witchy, McWitchy, <laughs> I'm back with another episode of Witches of Westeros and Essos. If you missed the last episode, which was Witch, Witchy, Witch, Mary Mazdor with Aziz from History of Westeros, I will link that in the description box and all of the Witchy Westeros Witches playlists. I feel like I just said witches like a thousand times. <laughs> so today I will be looking into the fiery heart of everyone's favorite red witch melisandra and to do this i brought on a special guest robert from in deep geek what's up robert hey great to be here always an honor to be on your channel gray oh my gosh thank you for coming we have to get robert to read some of the quotes <laughs> well, yeah you need to give me some notice so I can get some quotes in front of me i'd be delighted <laughs> okay so melisandra um when i was doing the research for this I found an interesting quote and it's by George and it says that Melisandre may be the most misunderstood character in the series. Uh, she, I definitely feel that she's a very misunderstood character, somewhat of a gray character. Um, and George, the, the question in the interview um, was who was the most misunderstood and they said Melisandre. Do you have any thoughts on why she would be misunderstood? Yeah, well, many. Uh, I could talk about this for a long time. Um, so Davos, I remember, asked her to her face, are you good or evil? And she said, oh, good. I'm a knight of sorts myself, sweet sir, a champion of light and life. So I think the first thing here is that she thinks of herself as being one of the good guys. She's on the side of righteousness and peace and harmony and all the good things. And we don't tend to think of her that way, but that's how she sees herself. Uh, I've got a Tim Pot theory that I'll come to later about why else we might be misunderstanding her, but I think this is the crux of the matter, is that she is the classic George R. R. Martin character who thinks that she is doing everything right, who thinks that she is uh, pursuing the, the, the best path for literally all of humanity. She, she thinks that she knows how to save humanity. And so if she has to do a few uh, slightly grey things along the way, then so be it. She honestly, in her heart, believes that she is a good person. And that, I think, is why she's misunderstood. Yeah, I agree with that take. I, I definitely think that she does think that she's doing whatever, all the things that she's doing, and no matter how horrible they are, they are for the greater good. Um, when I first was introduced to Melisandre in the uh, prologue of A Clash of Kings. I, 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 I was kind of thinking, yeah, okay, like all smoke, no fire, you know what I mean? Like just another character that thinks they're like magical and, they, and they're and they like prophesy. I don't want to say prophesy because Maester Crescent didn't prophesy about Melisandre, but she, he definitely thought that she was the root of ruin in Stannis' camp. And prior to Shadow Baby Melisandre, I was just like, you know, she's all smoke, no fire. But when the, but she really has magic, and and I think one of the main questions that I have when it comes to Melisandre is, where does her magic come from? Who is she really? How old is she really? What brought her to Dragonstone? What brought her to Stannis? And I think we have time to go over all of that well at least like the major things and events and like try to unravel some witchy secrets <laughs> from Melisandre and I think and and this is the another one of these things that makes slightly misunderstood that she is a magic user and she is powerful but she gets it wrong a huge amount of the time. It's it's actually one of the things that I go into, like, every time I look at something she says, I think my starting point is that she is wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not that she's she has, she has she sees things that are true in the flames, but she interprets them incorrectly. And I think, again, this is the kind of thing that we get wrong. She is very, very powerful. Very powerful. Um, I was looking over all of the magic that she's done and she's done quite 
a lot of magic. She's probably one of the most magicals, if not the most magical characters that we have seen so far. I mean, maybe Blood Raven might be more magic. I don't know. I, I think it's Melisandre. Like, just all of the things that she's done so far. And like you said, she does get it wrong a lot. And what's interesting about that she gets it wrong is later in A Dance with Dragons, she says that she is the best and the most skilled at this in her order. Yes. And, and, and I think the thing is that she also slightly second guesses herself. And uh, I mean, I'm going to give you an example now of something I think is an example of George R. R. Martin's genius writing, which is there's this great uh, line that I'm sure you know when she says, you know, I look in, I ask to, to see Azora a high in the flames and all I see is snow. Now, when it's a chapter from her perspective, the word snow is capitalized. She knows and she's saying she sees Jon Snow. That's mm -hmm. what it is. But when we hear this from someone else's perspective, the word is not capitalized because that's what that person heard was just snow on the ground. All she sees is snow. So this is this is the problem is that there are two layers here she gets it wrong a huge amount because she looks to see azora high she's expecting to see stannis she sees Jon snow she thinks oh that's that's wrong she should probably take that slightly more seriously uh and then there's another layer when people misinterpret what she says as well so there's there's at least a couple of layers of misinterpretation happening every time she comes out with something yeah definitely that's a good point and so basically, they did show her, they did show her Azor Ahai, but because it wasn't Stannis, she didn't think it was Azor Ahai. Well, yeah. She should have just said, show me Stannis. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I'm, I'm not a, a complete subscriber to John equals Azor Ahai, but I think that the, clearly Stannis is not, and, and that's, where, that's where I'm coming from. Well, speaking of Stannis, her first introduction, or... Yeah, Melisandre's first introduction is in the prologue of A Clash of Kings. And that prologue is from Maester Crescent's point of view, and it's set on Dragonstone. And we know the kind of man that Stannis is, so I really think it's unlikely that he sought Melisandre out. But we do have some insight from a fan question that George R.R. R. Martin answered. And the question was, why did Melisandre seek out Stannis? Did she see him in her flames and, de and decided to seek him out on her own? Or is she on a mission on behalf of the Red Priest? It doesn't seem at any point as if the latter is the case when you compare to Makoro, who was sent out by the priesthood. And George R.R. R. Martin said, you're right. Melisandre has gone to Stannis entirely on her own and has her own agenda. So George is basically saying that Melly is acting on her own and she wasn't sent by the Red Priest like Makoro was sent to Daenerys and she's acting on her own and she doesn't and she does have her own agenda and that agenda seems to be finding the prince that was promised and maybe finding some greater power and this has guided her to Stannis or if not Stannis directly it took her to Dragonstone. Do you have any insight or thoughts about that? why she went for Stannis? Well, um, I, I can only go from what we know, which is, so she went to Dragonstone because there's this great prophecy about uh, the, the prince that was promised with um, uh, smoke and salt, and she she interpreted this as being Dragonstone because there are lots of it's, it's a very smoky place and there's the salty sea uh, and so that's where she went and she went there because she saw stuff in the flames that right. took her there so it seems that once she'd got herself there she was then looking around to say well who is this the, the Azora High who is the prince that was promised and frankly at that time the person who was there was Stannis. Now, she seems to have seen him in her visions, and we can only assume 
based on who she is and her track record, that she saw him and thought this means that he is Azora High. Now, what the interesting thing as far as I'm concerned is, is that Stannis did not immediately go, oh yeah, I'm Azora High. <laughs> He, that's not where he came from. He was like when he was. He has these great chats with Davos, and he basically sort of like goes and says, uh, "Yeah, you know what? Like the men are scared of her, and like if I keep her on side, then they'll follow me and all the rest of it." And he's he's like he thinks he's playing her as much as she is playing him. So uh, it's it's almost like this. Um, marriage of people who are wanting their own thing but never actually tell each other the exact truth it's it's quite an odd relationship between the two of them the the true believer is not stannis the true believer is selice his wife yes yeah definitely i would i was this like i i can never no, like how that first conversation between <laughs> Stannis and Melisandre went because just knowing the kind of guy that Stannis is, I could just see him like, uh, oh yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> I'm the son of fire. <laughs> sure, I'm the son of fire. I- I'm in the heart of our lord, but he he he's not a believer, but I would say in the end, towards the end, he kind of believes that He's he has this greater destiny, and he believes in the Azora High. Like he's buying into it a little bit more. But I th- yeah. I think it has to do with like her showing him the power that she has. I, I think that's right, and I think she does. There's, there's also I think there's a quite a turning point here in how Stannis views himself, and therefore also how Melisandre views him, which is that Stannis thought that he was fourth in line to the throne he thought he was never going to inherit though you know his his brother was the king and stannis you know what stannis is like he's down he 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 he, he says you know i'm just going to do what is right all the time he thought that robert baratheon's three children that we you know that that cersei had that they were his true heirs he thought that he was not going to inherit he thought that he was just like the the, the middle brother who doesn't get anything much then we get Ned Stark unraveling all of this, and John Arryn did his bit as well. And then suddenly, Stannis is filled with this huge kind of righteous indignation, and he believes that he is the heir to the Iron Throne. And in fact, when Robert dies, he thinks that he is the rightful king of the Seven Kingdoms. Mm-hmm. That's the point that his mindset changed from being I'm just like this kind of you know, misunderstood middle son who is slightly, you know, he was given the smelly castle rather than Stormland, the great castle. He he suddenly thought, actually, I'm the king. And that's the point at which Melisandre came in. Because Melisandre arrived years, a few years before the action that we start reading about. Mm-hmm. And it's only, she only seems to take some kind of effect around the time that we know about. So, yeah, she did r- arrive um, a few years prior, and she actually converted Selyse. But at this time, Stannis is inhabiting Dragonstone. I think what actually brought her to Westeros was Dragonstone, because she's trying to find this Azor High prophecy, and this Azor High prophecy says that they'll wake dragons from stone. What better place to wake dragons from stone than a place called Dragonstone? Yeah. So I think that was part of the reason that she went. And when she got to Dragonstone, she was like, oh, these people are here. Let me look at my fires and see what they say. And then she misinterpreted and she misinterpreted some shit and they they became cool. But Melisandre is beautiful. Like she's probably described as one of the most beautiful characters. Like by all accounts, she's beautiful. And in the show, in season six, I know we're doing book stuffs here, but I wanted to talk about the show a little bit. Um, sure. She's revealed to be much older, like a much older woman. And I'm not sure if that's something that only the show did or if that will translate into the books. But I do think it's very possibly the case that this is from the books. And I think it's almost certainly probably the same. Um, her chapter in A Dance with Dragons seems to hint at her being like incredibly old and also not even alive anymore uh i'm gonna read this quote real quick 
Whenever she was asked what she saw within her fires, Melisandre would answer much and more. But seeing was never as simple as those words suggested. It was an art, and like all arts, it demanded mastery, discipline, study, pain, that too. Relor spoke to his chosen ones through blessed fires, in a language of ash and cinder and twisting flame that only a god could truly grasp. Melisandre had practiced her art for years beyond count, and she had paid the price. There was no one, even in her order, who had her skills at seeing the secrets half revealed and half concealed within the sacred flames. So she says that she studied this stuff for years beyond count. And it makes it seem to me like it's a very long time ago. And she also says that, you know, she's the most skilled in her order, which is kind of scary because she doesn't really seem that skilled, like we talked about earlier, that she interpreted interpret it wrong a lot. Um, but she also doesn't really even seem alive because when you read further on, you find out that she doesn't really eat or sleep. She does, but barely. It's almost like she's immortal. So do you think that's something that will be the same in the books or no? Oh yeah, so I think that uh, Years Beyond Count clearly suggests that she's a lot older than she looks. Now, um, we have very little information about her past life. We know that she has this memory of being Melanie Lot 7, being sold into slavery. We know that she uh, was sold to the Red Priests and that she grew up among the Red Priests. Um, I think that, I mean, it's a slightly um, uh, small distinction perhaps, but when she says she is the most talented uh, at uh, seeing what is in the flames, it's not she's the most talented about understanding them or interpreting them. I think that that's quite an important distinction. I think that she does see things ridiculously easily. Um, these things, if you take magic across the piece, uh, not just in George R. R. Martin, but he, he said this across all of fantasy fiction, there's always a price for doing magic, but she seems to be able to see these visions in the flames almost almost without a cost. Um, and that, for me, says that she's incredibly powerful at seeing things. What she's not powerful at is interpreting them. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think, sorry, to, to, to pick up on what you were saying about the not sleeping and not eating, what she, what she says, because we only get the one chapter from her point of view, and in that chapter, she basically says she doesn't see so she sometimes sleeps a little bit but she basically spends all night just sitting by the fire um, and uh, she does eat sometimes but it's more for show than because she needs it and all of these things for me tie in with this idea as when you add in the fact that she's very old with the idea that somehow maybe she is this kind of fire white which is this concept that George R. R. Martin introduced I think it was with Time it might have been Entertainment Weekly a couple of years ago when he was talking about Beric and he said that he was a fire white so he's like the whites that we know but he's animated by fire and he loses love of food and he doesn't eat much and he doesn't need to sleep much and he loses huge amounts of his past and his soul and who he is and Melisandre seems really quite similar so it's uh, it's my kind of like slightly tinfoil theory that she is a fire white herself and she has survived for you know maybe a few hundred years and is still the person that she was but this shows with all of the fire whites that we know about when we get Beric and we get Lady Stoneheart, they focus in on the thing that drives them. And this is very much about Melisandre. She doesn't care about anything else. She just cares about the thing which drives her, which is about finding Azor High and about, as she sees it, saving the world against the Great Other. I don't think that theory is really tinfoil that makes a lot of that makes a lot of sense she probably is a fire white because that makes sense because when she says 
like I I don't need to eat. Uh, I don't need to sleep. It's something that is best concealed from mortal men. That's like saying, okay, I'm not mortal. She's not normal human. <laughs> That's that much that much we know. Yes, and it like Barrick does focus on what drives him. Catelyn Stark does focus on what drives him. Jon Snow, which has not been brought back in the books yet, but on the show, he very much focuses on what drives him. Um, even even down to how season eight ended, it was it was what drove him that drove him to do the things that he did, the awful things that he did. I'm not gonna go into the things that he did. Because that would be a whole nother thing. But I don't think that's tinfoil at all. I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. With tin, Thank you. Tinfoil is like... I'm not going to say what tinfoil is, because then that would be a whole... Well, it's, this, is, this is based on what we know, and it's my best understanding. Given what we know, it's what seems to make the most sense. But I'm delighted that I've won you over, Greg. This is, <laughs> this is yes. exciting. You can be an evangelist <laughs> with me for this theory. You've won me over because it would make sense for my theory. Um, and my theory is that Melisandre, the whole Melanie Lot 7... To me, Melanie is not an Eastern name. Most of the Eastern names that we have are like sp- spicy. Um, mm. And then we have like a, a plain name like Melanie, which I mean, I'm sure there are people with plain names in Essos. But there's this, this uh, her magic is stronger at the wall. Uh, and she hears this Melanie Lot 7, which means that she was likely sold as a child as a slave but we don't know where she initially came from Arya knows that like slavers are being brought through bravos uh because pirates have taken them from hard home like wildlings and they're gonna be slaves now and that's not something new like this has happened before at hard home so I think Melisandre could have came from hard home came across the narrow sea and was sold as a slave although she doesn't have like the tattoos of a of a valent of was that Valentinese slave. She doesn't have um, the tattoos. And then with a shy, like we know for sure that she doesn't come from a shy. Like she wasn't born in a shy, because children don't live in a shy. Nothing lives in a shy. But old people or older people. <laughs> um, but yeah, it just doesn't add up and also because of her eye color being red the like g- the ghost of high heart has red eyes blood raven has red eyes like these are people that are tied to the weirwood like that are westerosi people and then and then the other red eyed things are like drogon and ghost but so it could be like a wild a, she could have been a wildling and she was taken off to slavery, sold, and she doesn't really like it's bit it was so long ago that it's ancient now. And when she has those dreams of Hard Home or those visions of Hard Home, and like um she sees the caves going out and I'm wondering is she dreaming of what John goes through at Hard Home, which doesn't really happen on in the books, what or what what happens at Hard Home. Leave John let's leave John out of it. And um, is she dreaming of that, like Cotter Pike going to Hard Home and just Hard Home being attacked by White Walkers, or is she seeing the past where there was like this volcanic eruption at Hard Home? Like, what is she? What is she seeing? And then there's like this other theory that she is Melisandre's. Melisandre is Blood Raven. And Shira Seastar's daughter, which I don't really know the crux of the theory or what all that goes on, but I think it's a good theory. I've heard a lot, like a lot of people talk about that. Do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I think it's a bad theory. <laughs> I, 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 I think, I mean, I love, I love the idea that you tie everything in together, but at the same time, 
I think this makes the world a lot smaller. I think George R. R. Martin is about having a massive world. And uh, I think that the, the, of the bits of information we know about Melisandre, the, the one thing we know about her childhood was that she was sold into slavery. Now, if she was Shira Seastar's child, uh, whether or not Blood Raven knew about her, I see no way, no reason why she would be sold into slavery. Mm -hmm. So that, for me, makes very little sense. I mean, maybe there's something else there that we don't know about. I I mean, I have to admit, I do like your theory that she might be from north of the wall. We know that Tyrosh and, uh, and a few of the other free cities, we got we got in the world of ice and fire that they, they have done slaving missions all the way up to beyond the wall. So we've got this from George R. R. Martin that this does happen. And as you say, with her hair and her colouring, her colouring is, is, her skin is described as being white. That's not the kind of colouring that we get from people in Essos, particularly sort of Far East Essos. So um, the sort of the white skin, the the red hair, the red eyes, this is all the kind of the kissed by fire kind of feel. It makes a huge amount of sense that, yeah, for me, she may well have come from one of the wildling places, maybe even hard home. Um, uh, that kind of then ties into this kind of idea. So she was taken down to somewhere like Tyrosh, sold into slavery to the, uh, the, uh, the red priests. Then she went renegade and she went to a shy because as you say the children there aren't children in a shy mm -hmm. so she we know that she is called Melisandre of a shy so that's where she's known what she's known as being so when she emerged from a shy that's the point at which people started taking notice of her and then they gave her that kind of moniker of a shy so i think that seems to be what the path is the idea that she came from some kind of noble birth but within a few years was immediately sold into slavery that doesn't quite work for me i have to say yeah i mean i, I don't i like the idea of it like i would love her to be shira sea star's daughter just because i like shira sea star but i would love <laughs> for her more to be shira sea star but yeah the slavery part of it doesn't really work not not when the Targaryens were at the point that they were. Like, Daenerys being sold into slavery, the Targaryen dynasty was basically doomed. But uh, a daughter between Shira and Bloodraven had, would have no reason to be sold mm. into slavery. But another thing that I wanted to touch on was, what do you, do you think, given that Melisandre is old AF... <laughs> Do you think that she could have been one of the people that Aegon the Fifth had commissioned from a shy? Oh, I mean, it's possible. So, so these are the people uh, that. Uh, so, this is Egg from the Duncan Egg stories when he grows up and he becomes the king. He then tries to figure out how to hatch all these dragon eggs that are hanging around. Um, I think, uh, for my money, it's possible, but we literally have no evidence. No so evidence. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, I like the idea, and it kind of makes sense, but I don't think that we've got anything to go on here. I mean, I... I I'd love that this is where tinfoil comes in when we can, like <laughs> we can we can come up with a theory based on no evidence yeah but that's tinfoil feels good <laughs> uh so yeah I, I I'll go with this it feels good but I we have no evidence to say it's actually the case yeah the thing that made me wonder or question that was that Melisandre there I feel like there was something that had to make her turn her eye west like there was something like she she had to turn her eye west there i don't think that she well maybe she could have just been like still looking for azora high and they showed her like king's landing or something so that was is what made her go west or maybe she was looking for the last dragon and that was in the west so it could have been those things but i always wondered if aegon had sparked something in melisandre and given her age just maybe she could have been around but yeah i mean that, 
sorry. I mean, I think I think that's right. But I think that the uh, the the for me, if she's looking into the it makes sense as a sort of a motivation she's looking for azora high she's looking for the clues and the clues are stone dragons turn to flesh Mm -hmm. so she says show me stone dragons where are stone dragons dragonstone (laughs) as as a castle has got stone dragons everywhere everywhere that's what she would see it's like i mean the 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 gates have got like a there's a a dragon tail going over them there's like you 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 the the crenellations are just dragons out of stone it's everywhere there are stone dragons so for me this makes perfect sense that if she says show me stone dragons she sees dragonstone and then she looks around and goes whoa hang on a moment there's a lot of smoke here. I mean, wait, is that salt water? I, I mean, that that for me seems to make sense for why she went to Dragonstone. Exactly. Yeah, I, nice. exactly. That makes sense for me for why she went. She looked west, and why she looks to Dragonstone. I think the egg on the fifth thing. I, I mean, I love the idea. I just don't think that we've got any evidence for it. Yeah, we'll have to wait. We'll have to wait and see what happens in Dunkin' Egg, like, volume 8, <laughs> when, it com- <laughs> when it comes out when we're, like, 70. <laughs> in 2053. <laughs> yes. So we have seen, like, several bits of Melisandre's magical abilities. She drinks the strangler poison and she doesn't die. She has shadows kill Renly and Courtney Penrose. She can see the future in the flames or she could see threats to her person. Like she said, she always sees those first. She does this weird thing with um, Oral's eagle. Like she scorches the soul of Oral out of the eagle and she also like whenever she does this like fireball thing well she takes credit for it whenever she does this it causes Vermeer six skins to lose control of some of his animals that he has war bonds with um she can do glamours on people she's she's very powerful but where does her magic come from does it come from R'hllor is there one magic source in all of Westeros? That's kind of what I lead to. There's one source of magic and these religions and different things use it how they see fit. Um, but do you have any ideas about where her magic com- comes from? Um, yeah, I think I would agree with you that there is one magic source. I think that the as you were saying that about Oral and Faramir... I think that actually that is really important or will be really important for the first few chapters of The Winds of Winter because what we have seen, and George R. R. Martin loves doing this, showing us little hints of what's going to come, foreshadowing and all the rest, she can get into that kind of skin-changing relationship. She can intercept whatever magic is going on there between the skin-changer and the animal that they are inhabiting. She, She can... Exactly, and and what I am sure, it's not just my view, and many others have this view as well, but what I think that will happen is that John has died at the end of the last book, and uh, unlike the show when he just like dies and is brought back, I think that what is going to happen in the books is that he's going to die and go into, he's going to skin change into ghost. And so actually what we're going to have is a situation where... John's soul has to somehow be called back from Ghost into his own body. And that is really important because she has shown that she can intercept that relationship between the skin changer and the animal that they have thrown their soul into in some way. So I think what we're going to see is the culmination of that foreshadowing that George R. R. Martin has given us with Oral, with uh, Varamir Six Skins and so on. But that's a complete digression. We talked th- about that on our Life After Death panel at Con of Thrones. Oh, we did. We absolutely did. I, I talk about this every single chance <laughs> I get the opportunity. Uh, I mean, I, th- I think in terms of the actual point that you were saying, in terms of where magic comes from, George R. R. Martin has been very clear. We're never going to see the gods here. This is not. This is not a, a, a story where we're going to suddenly see, oh yeah, so R'hllor is real and all the rest <laughs> of it. Uh, so it, it seems that 
her magic, as everyone else's magic, has some kind of source in the world because it's a magical world, and there is uh, th there are various factors that make magic more effective and less effective. Uh, all magic has a cost. Magic seems to be affected by uh, stuff that comes from above, like these kind of comets and all the rest of it. Um, and where there is some magic then that seems to amplify the magic that is done there, like at the wall, for example. It makes magical places. So there, it seems to be all the same, regardless of what you think you're doing or wherever you think you're getting your power from. It does seem to be that there is just a general magicness about the world that some people can tap into. Yeah, when you look at the magic that's happened so far and you look at basically what it what it all revolves around it all revolves around fire and blood that's what yeah. it seems like all marwin says all valyrian magic was fire and well blood. valyrian magic yeah but then you have relor like melisandre she uses fire and she sacrifices people to fire to make to get these different outcomes or to make these things happen she believes that if she burns someone with king's blood that she can wake dragons from stone and we know that egg believed that or aegon believed that well we think we know that aegon believed that um and uh, maester aemon says something at the wall like you know better men than stannis have done worse things and then he's like mumbling about the father first and then the son so that makes us think that egg and dunk were like some kind of sacrifices to hatch dragons and then you have daenerys daenerys uses fire and blood sacrifice and then you have the children of the forest which sacrificed people to the trees they didn't necessarily use fire that we know of but they did possibly use dragon glass as a magical element and dragon glass is actually in valyrian it's a term it's called a term that means frozen fire so there's always like this fire and blood element and i think all the magic basically is coming from one thing so we definitely agree on that and then just stronger and more powerful people can tap into it um, I, there was this, there's this thing with George R. R. Martin, and I don't know if you would, if we could touch on it just a little bit. There and, are so many things with George R. R. Martin. <laughs> and, then, and then we can wrap this up. But do you remember, there was like this article done about this figurine that George had got done. And it was of Melisandre, but George had got the artist to make this statue look kind of icy mm -hmm. like blue a everywhere that it was it should have been fire it was blue so blue uh blue fire all, all the imagery is icy i'll put a picture of it on the screen like of the original one and the one that george got commissioned just for him uh did you have why would he do that uh, well i mean this is trying to see into the brain of the master right <laughs> uh but i my take is that this is the song of ice and fire and where he has always come from is that this is a story about two threats this comes from the robert frost poem as well as many other places two threats that could both destroy humanity ice and fire and we sometimes think of it as just being ice could destroy the world but actually fire could destroy the world they tried to show that i think on the show um and there are these two threats and they are the same in a sense yes they're very different but both of them when you uh, read the language he uses is about you know that that both fire and ice burn and I think what he was doing there was he was taking the character that is most fire. There's no, you can't think of any, there's nothing about Melisandre that is in any way ice. She's just fire. Uh, her magic is fire. Her, her character is fiery. Her hair is flame red. It's all about fire. 
And I think what he was doing was just characterising what was important for him about his overall theme about fire and ice both being important and both being able to destroy the world. Is saying, actually, you know what, I can have a character who is just like this but fire, and but ice, and that would be exactly the same because both of these forces could destroy the world equally. Think, That's my take. Yeah, I think you hit it on the head. Like, I don't even need to add anything. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, yeah, I kind of agree with you that he, that, especially what you were saying about ice and fire being, like, kind of the same. Like, uh, I think it's Jojen that says, if ice and fire, if love and hate can make. Jojen says, if ice can burn, then love and hate can mate. Mountain or marsh, it makes no matter the land is one so those figurines are basically like that quote in one yeah exactly and and the this is where if we're going to go meta with this this is where john comes in because he is the merging of ice and fire of liana and rhaegar that is that is his role is that he is the song of ice and fire now where we go with that after we've got that established is is an entirely different podcast and discussion i'm sure <laughs> but that is the whole point is that we get ice and we get fire and we get the merging of the two which creates dragon glass and it creates Jon snow i guess we can wrap up here because we kind of went through melisandre not in depth but i know we both have in depth melisandre discussions and theory videos on both of our channels i appreciate you for coming on to witchy westeros <laughs> and giving your melisandre take do you want to let the people know where they can find you what you're up to i know it's been like a drought here lately of a song of ice and fire content and i know you're probably like in the same boat as me where you don't care and you want to keep continuing making a song of ice and fire content yeah absolutely so for those who don't know my channel is in deep geek i do a song of ice and fire content what i'm doing on that channel is i'm focusing now on the build up well two things one is the build up to the winds of winter and one is finishing off my series on robert's rebellion and what really happened at the tower of joy so i'm going to finish that up and then focus on a build up to the winds of winter looking at the the unanswered questions and making some predictions about what happens next but i'm also covering two other series i'm going to be covering westworld season three is coming out next year really looking forward to that and i've started my lord of the rings content i'm a huge tolkien fan and this is something i've been looking forward to do doing for ages so uh started doing some tolkien videos uh, building up for whenever the amazon a huge budget tv show appears i can't wait to see the show i read the books when i was younger and I can't wait to see the show. I'm glad to see you're covering that, though. You should. Um, but yes, um, for those of you that might just watch the show only, or might just have watched Game of Thrones, A Song of Ice and Fire will never die on my channel, and uh, hopefully on Robert's as well. I, I think we're pretty committed to covering this. But thanks again for coming and thank everyone for watching and head on over to Robert's channel and check him out. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Hit the notification bell and I'll see you later. Okay, my sweet summer children. Have a good day.